I was raised on TV and grew up in the public eye since I was 10 years old. You talk about growing up in a fishbowl. For the millions of fans of 19 Kids and Counting, Ginger Duggar's life seemed idyllic as the fourth of nine daughters in the conservative Christian mega family, the Duggars. Her parents, Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, were devout followers of the Institute in Basic Life Principles, an organization established by Minister Bill Gothard. Children, when they are afraid they'll be abandoned by their parents, they develop asthma. Ginger Duggar, born December 21, 1993, is the sixth child of Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, who are famously known for their very large family and ultra-conservative beliefs. The Duggars initially rose to fame in 2004 with a documentary on their unconventional family, which led to their hit TLC reality show, 19 Kids and Counting. Over the years, they have remained a controversial family, often in the public eye due to their overt religious beliefs, as well as disturbing scandals that have shocked the nation, related to their eldest child, Josh Duggar, who is currently serving a 12-year sentence for viewing and receiving child abuse material. From the beginning, the Duggars have been questioned about their faith, as many describe them to be part of a cult with extreme rules. The Duggars have always denied and refuted these claims. But after spending two decades in the spotlight, Ginger Duggar is ready to speak her truth. In this video, we will examine parts of Ginger's book, Becoming Free Indeed, where she disentangles the false teachings and cult-like upbringing she was subjected to. So I first had the idea to write this book back in 2017. Jeremy and I had just attended a conference that Bill Gothard had started many years before. And while I was there, I saw so many of my old friends who were still there at the IBLP conference. And then I also heard stories of those who had totally left the faith because they were sold a false version of Christianity. And it was very confusing, these teachings were that Bill Gothard taught. So I started to feel like man, this is so sad. And my heart was just breaking, hearing these stories and seeing the devastation in the lives of those who had sought to follow these teachings. And that's what made me want to write this book. Ginger describes her life as growing up in a fishbowl, being the sixth child of 19 children with very strict parents. Ginger and her siblings grew up in a close, tight-knit setting where they weren't exposed to much of the outside world. Her parents followed the teachings of a man named Bill Gothard, who rose to fame in the 60s and 70s during the counterculture movement. He promised parents who were terrified of their children being swept away by a secular world that he had the answers to all of their problems, and that if they followed his seven basic principles, they would have fruitful lives. These teachings are what Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar instilled in their children. Um, I think the older I got, I started to see that their were harmful sides to a theology I was raised in. And that was based on a teacher, Bill Gothard, who had promised the guarantee for success to many families. So in the 60s, there was a movement, you know, drug, drugs and rock and roll that was happening and parents were terrified. They said, how can we keep our kids from falling into this? How can we give them a foundation for life that will last, that will guarantee their success? So he began to give this guarantee to families that if you follow these seven basic principles, then your life will be blessed and God will um, help your families to love Jesus. So that was sounded like a good guarantee and foundation. So many families fell into that and started to take their kids to conferences and teach them these principles, have a curriculum come in from this man. Um, sadly, it was not based on scripture, even though he claimed it was. It was based mm -hmm. on rules. It was based on his, his own idea of what could shelter and keep your families together. And ultimately, in the end, we know that it just doesn't work. Ginger writes that the Christianity in her childhood elements of the true gospel of Jesus Christ were tangled up with false teaching. This enlightenment wouldn't come to Ginger that easily. It would take years for her to come to this conclusion. In her book, Ginger takes the reader through her journey of disentangling and deconstructing the indoctrination she received for most of her life. When everybody would be talking about um, how they were saved, I would always say, yeah, I, I, I was a Christian. I became a Christian at five. 
I prayed a prayer and I'm saved. And that was kind of what I would say. But in my heart, I was so terrified that if I died, I would be separated from God forever in hell. And I knew in my heart of hearts that there was no no certainty that I was saved. And so that terrified me. I remember I would wake up at night and I would just be so scared. As a little girl, Ginger was a very fear-based child with that fear intensifying as she got older. She writes about how her fear of God was so crippling. She thought that if she sinned, even in the slightest way, that God would come down and unleash his wrath upon her. Ginger writes, For as long as I can remember, I followed the teachings of a man named Bill Gothard. My parents introduced me and my siblings to Gothard and his seminars. They started listening to his teachings not long after they were married, and they applied many of his principles as they raised me and my siblings. It's no exaggeration to say that Gothard was the most important influence in my life outside of my family. In his lectures, he claimed he had discovered the key to a successful Christian life. According to Gothard, to enjoy God's blessings, a Christian should closely follow what he laid out in his seminars, the principles of design, authority, responsibility, suffering, ownership, freedom, and success. Now, the root cause means that we come face to face with the basic principles of life. These are universal. They are non-optional. Every single person in the world must build his and her life around these seven principles. The principle of design, the principle of authority, the principle of responsibility, of suffering, of ownership, of freedom, and of success. If we don't build our lives around these seven principles, then we're going to have these root problems, we'll have surface wrong attitudes and surface problems, and our life will be one continuous failure from what God knows our potential could be. In fact, um, there is a major problem with these principles. They are just opposite to our natural inclination. Ginger explains how these principles effectively dominated her life, writing, First, they were absolute. Gothard spoke in black and white terms. He said there was a right way and a wrong way to live. For those who lived the right way, who followed his principles, God's blessings were guaranteed. Health, money, success, and happiness were available to them. Second, his principles were practical. They could be applied immediately. Finally, these principles were specific. Gothard would teach a principle and then tell you exactly what that principle looked like in everyday life. For instance, when discussing the topic of modesty, which fell under the principle of responsibility, among others, he identified which outfits were modest and which were not, teaching us that you reap what you sow. Life is hooked up in a very delicate cause and effect sequence. In fact, we're going to see this week that the causes and effects are in unrelated areas. Here's a man who wonders why he's having business problems, financial problems. He doesn't know that God has a clear relationship between his moral life and his business life. Now, there are other relations, too, that would affect business, but that's just one. Here's a person who wonders why his children are reacting. He doesn't know that God has a very clear relationship between his honoring of his parents and the response of his children to him. And in more and more ways, God has a very clear cause and effect sequence. And that's why God wants you and me to differentiate between wisdom and reason. In his seminars, Gothard heavily taught what he considered to be one of the most important aspects of his teachings, the umbrella of authority. Ginger writes, According to Gothard, God gives every person authority figures who must always be obeyed. Just as an umbrella protects against rain, these authorities protect a person from spiritual harm, including suffering, pain, and temptations from Satan. Likewise, according to Gothard's teaching, one act of disobedience, even an unintended act or rebellion against authority, could result in God's punishment. 
Gothard taught that by rebelling, we were subjecting ourselves to the realm and power of Satan. Now we have the problem of rebellion. Rebellion is like witchcraft, stubbornness like iniquity, rebellion like um, witchcraft. What, what is witchcraft? Witchcraft is exposing myself to the realm of Satan's power. How does that work? God tells us in Scripture that every one of us has like umbrellas of protection, structures of authority. Sons and daughters are under the protection of parents. We have the protection of civil government. We have the protection of, of church leaders, the protection of employers. These different umbrellas of protection. As long as we're under these umbrellas of protection, Satan cannot get through with destructive temptations. But if we get out from under that umbrella, we expose ourselves to the realm and the power of Satan's control. By following Gothard's teachings, Ginger's life turned into a checklist. She made sure to adhere to his umbrella of authority by following every rule and guideline her parents set for her, as well as following Gothard's seven principles. Ginger concluded that all she needed to do was deposit the exact lifestyle Gothard advocated, and she would withdraw health, money, a wonderful husband, and a bushel of godly kids. She writes, But this cause and effect view was also terrifying, because I thought I would experience devastating consequences for any mistakes I made. Growing up, there were several things the children were prohibited from doing. In her book, Ginger details what some of those prohibitions were. Let's go through a few of them. The first one we will discuss is how Bill Gothard forbade his followers from listening to rock music or any music with a beat or drums. He created a lesson for his followers on how they should evaluate music. He would supply these tapes to families so that they could play them and teach their children about the music they should and shouldn't listen to. Here is a clip from one of the tapes. Each message and each performance must be carefully evaluated to decide its acceptability for worship and edification. We are not saying that the singer or composer deliberately set out to be deceptive or manipulative in his message. Let's begin with a positive example, one in which all the words and implied ideas are accurate, and the melody carries the message in a way that enhances it. Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me, lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Some contemporary Christian artists make no bones about it. They call themselves rock bands and build themselves as giving rock concerts. Listen to this example. All the elements of rock music are present in it. Others are much more subtle claiming to enjoy all forms of expressing themselves to the Lord, but the results are plain in the sound. The bottom line is that the rhythms and volume of rock music were specifically designed to be the sound of the countercultural, symbolizing the rebelliousness of young people in the 60s, not only to their parents, but towards all authorities as well. The people who created this sound knew what it was and deliberately set out to infect America's young people with it. Rock music always travels in a quartet. Its partners are drugs, immorality, and rebellion. In addition to the children listening to these tapes, Gothard would also tell them elaborate stories to keep them in a constant state of fear. It was interesting. I, I started to realize the older I got, 
why am I thinking this way? Why do I think that God is going to punish me for something I don't even know I'm doing wrong? So for mm-hmm. instance, like as, as a kid, um, I was taught that rock music or drums in general, like even in Christian music was bad. And if I listened to that, like praise and worship music with drums, that God could punish me for it because I'm listening to music with drums. Now in the Bible, it says nothing about that. And it mm-hmm. only talks about praising the Lord with, you know, tambourine and, and harp and like all these things. And, but I didn't see that. And so I would be terrified that I was going to be in a car accident if I was in a car that was playing that music. Right. So I became superstitious. That was also taught in the teaching that there was a young man who was listening to rock music and was killed in a car accident. So of course you realize you're, you're, perspective on life starts to be one of not what is God's word saying, but what was I taught? What does this teacher say I'm supposed to do or not do? And God views it that way as well. Like life is a very delicate cause and effect sequence. So if I do this, God's going to, God's going to punish me for this, even if it's not in the word of God. The next issue Gothard was firm on was modesty. His teachings taught that girls were not allowed to wear shorts, pants, or sleeveless shirts. Ginger writes, every skirt had to reach at least below the knee. I also wore blouses and shirts that covered the shoulders. That dress code was a big part of my life because Gothard said modesty was a serious responsibility for every Christian. Based on Gothard's teaching, I saw it as my responsibility to protect others' moral purity by dressing modestly. If someone struggled with impure thoughts because of something I wore, then I bore some responsibility for that person's sin. I needed to make sure no one stumbled because of my outfit choices. That's why I cared so much about my length of skirts, even down to the inches. But over time, Ginger would come to know that Bill Gothard's teachings on modesty and defrauding were false. Writing, The Bible does say modesty is important, but it doesn't say how long skirts should be or mandate shirt sleeves. Though the Bible warns against causing others to sin, it doesn't say that if someone has impure thoughts about me, I am at fault. That logic shifts blame away from the individual committing the sin. In extreme circumstances, it can put blame on the victims of abuse instead of the perpetrator. This is exactly what Gothard taught. In a document called Counseling SA that was given to attendees at IBLP's Advanced Training Institute, he said, God allows victims to be abused because of, quote, immodest dress, indecent exposure, being out from protection of our parents, and being with evil friends. This was from September 18th, 2015. Um, Last night, I had a good talk with one of my parents. The Lord has been convicting me about modesty. A few times I had on a borderline knee-length skirt that would come above my knee when sitting. God brought conviction into my heart in this area, so I asked for help in accountability. I wrote that, you know, probably late in the evening, sitting there thinking, oh no, why did I wear a skirt that would come here when sitting down Mm -hmm. as opposed to like an inch longer. So that's it. It was all outward rules based. In addition to these rules, Ginger expresses how that in order to fulfill these works and receive favor from the Lord, she read her Bible constantly, made sure not to eat certain foods or interact with outsiders who didn't share her beliefs. She writes, most have probably never heard those principles before, but for me, not a day went by when I didn't apply them to my life in some way. The future was so clear. By following his rules, I was going to marry in my early 20s, if not by the time I was 18 or 19. I was sure I'd marry a godly Christian man who worked, loved children, and made me laugh. I would quickly become a mother and have as many kids as possible. I'd stay home and take care of our growing family while my husband worked to keep us out of debt. Ginger's expectations for the future were so clear, so she thought. By the time she was a teenager, Ginger began having very serious conversations about marriage and children, which was high on Gothard's list of teachings. She writes, I grew up assuming that a woman starts having children as soon as she is married and continues until she physically can't have any more. Even if she has severe health issues or feels overwhelmed by the number of children she already has, she cannot stop having children. This belief was largely due to Gothard's teaching. His basic care booklet says this about pregnancy and children. What if another pregnancy will cause health problems? What should a woman do if her doctor tells her that another pregnancy will create serious or even life-threatening complications? What could a man do if he is warned, 
if you get your wife pregnant, you will be responsible for her death. Gothard taught that God's will was for a woman to have children no matter what, even if her life is in danger. Gothard also prohibited his followers from using birth control or any form of contraceptives. Ginger continues, Imagine this scenario. A man and woman get married. They immediately start having children because Gothard opposes any kind of birth control. Financially, they are not in a position to own a home because they are not allowed to go into debt. That means no mortgage. So they live in what they can afford, a tiny two-bedroom house that they rent. At first, that's okay because they only have one child, but then more children come. Next thing you know, they're six years into marriage with five children under five years old. To provide for the family, the husband works long hours. This takes the dad out of the house for 10, 12 hours a day. Since they're not allowed to send their kids to school, the mom is in the home with morning sickness from pregnancy for half the year, trying to manage and homeschool five kids. She feels overwhelmed, unable to handle the responsibility of raising so many children practically alone. Then the husband comes home and the house feels like chaos, but the wife has to have it all together to keep her husband faithful and satisfied. That's what Bill Gothard taught. The house must be clean, she must be happy with no expectations, and the children must be well behaved. The problem is, she's struggling to maintain her mental health and physical appearance, which is terrifying because it means her husband may start desiring other women. The guilt begins to build. On top of that, she is told she must be joyfully available to meet her husband's physical needs. More sex likely means more children. But they are told over and over to just trust God. Women were told by Gothard and others that marriage and child rearing were God's primary purposes for them. For Ginger, this was not a hypothetical situation, but a reality. A reality she was preparing herself for. Well, let me get back to you on that. Like kids was a huge thing because I thought it was a option to use any kind of contraceptive, like, or any kind Indeed of like all. yeah thing. Anything. Not just hormonal. I, yeah. No, no, no. But just even anything, I thought it was a sin and I was, it was abortion. And so I thought I have to have as many kids as possible. So we talked about that and he was kind of like, oh, well, of course I love kids. Um, and I was like, I think I do too. But I, I mean, I just thought I was going to have 19 kids. And yeah. so one took me more time because it was so big in my mind. And then clothing, like I remember we would... <laughs> We weren't allowed to buy shirts that were sleeveless at all, but we could roll our sleeves up when we were in the sun. That's okay. Okay. So <laughs> it's interesting, the letter of the law that I used to follow. And then I started to look back at that and say, wow, that was so weird. Why did I yeah. do it? Like, like, why didn't I see this in the word of God before or not see it? Though Ginger has now reached a place where she's been able to disentangle the false teachings of Bill Gothard, that wasn't always so. Ginger spent most of her life entrenched in his false teachings, which kept her in a constant state of fear. Due to this pressure, Ginger struggled with an ED and perfectionism. Gothard's seven principles would ultimately produce nothing but fear and exhaustion in Ginger's life. She writes that she was consumed with being introspective, overcome by paranoia. If you don't follow these things, you are going to fall out of the favor of God and your life will be in turmoil, right? Right, exactly. And I think that that type of teaching, it was so based on fear, superstition, superstition, manipulation and control. So it, as a kid growing up in that, it was interesting. I really thought that God was either pleased with me because of what I did, um, if I followed all the guidelines. And if I didn't, I really thought that God was just out to get me. Even as a believer, once I was saved at the age of 14, I knew the true gospel was not by salvation by works, but the way that played out, um, Bill Gothard multiple times would give a scenario and say, well, before you come to Christ, do X, Y, Z. And it was totally wrong, yeah. but I never said that salvation was by works, but I viewed God in that way. Like he's either pleased with me or not pleased with me based on an, a secondary issue, like a, a standard that yeah. this man set up. Like many of his followers, Ginger saw Gothard as a prophet, someone she trusted, who she felt was more like a grandfather in her life. Though she had this inner pull that what he taught and how he taught it was not biblical, it took years for Ginger to begin to open her eyes. In 2013, Ginger's older sister, Jessa, began courting a man named Ben. 
It was then when Ginger began to take a deeper look into the indoctrination she had been subjected to. It is interesting. My my shift began when I met my brother-in-law, Ben. He and his family, they had like little differences from ours. They still had a big family, but they lived their lives differently than us. And I saw their convictions were a little bit different. And I admired the way that they handled everything, though they weren't perfect. They had a different perspective on even outward standards that we would have held to. We held to like, you know, um, these certain modesty standards of wearing dresses only, Mm -hmm. the shirts, not listening to rock music, not, um, I mean, only courtship is the way to go, all these things, right? So I would look at their families, how can you be loving Jesus the way you do, so committed to scripture and still be okay? Because that was something that I think until then I had seen many families who were doing that, but I, it, it didn't catch my attention until it was my sister who was talking to this guy. So I started traveling to their church and visiting whenever my sister would. And it was there that I heard the preaching of God's word being one of um, going through scripture one verse at a time and in like taking sections of scripture and preaching through and that expository preaching, as they would call it, mm-hmm. was so yep. for me because I, I saw their commitment to the word of God being the ultimate authority for life. It wasn't a man's opinion on what you should wear or, or how you should um, go about, you know, your life in, in a way outside of scripture, being silent when scripture is silent, speaking when scripture speaks. So it was beautiful being able to observe as, you know, an outsider in their church, uh, yeah. seeing their heart for Christ and the deep commitment to the word of God as the ultimate authority. And so I started to observe that, but it wasn't until I met my husband, now husband, Jeremy, um, I, I really appreciated his knowledge of the word of God. But then we started listening to, once we were in a relationship, started listening to Bill Gothard's teaching. We would pause the video and um, go examine what he said in his seminars against the word of God. And it just didn't Mm -hmm. matter. After meeting Ben and later Jeremy, her now husband, Ginger began to intentionally dissect and disentangle all the falsehoods and false teachings that Bill Gothard drilled into her psyche. In order for Ginger to deconstruct his teachings, she had to go through them one by one. Starting with Gothard's teaching on design, Ginger writes, Gothard had a lot of ideas about design that I no longer believe. For example, he said that one of the best ways to find out God's design and why he allows defects in our lives is to look at the sins of our forefathers. So it is that the sins of the parents are passed on to the children down to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him. But, and never forget this last part, God shows mercy to thousands who love him and keep his commandments. If your father or grandfather was a drunkard, it's going to take five generations, according to Research that we have now, five generations of no liquor at all just to remove the proneness to alcoholism that's passed on to the children. If parents get involved in drugs, children can be born with deformities. If parents get involved in the occult, the children will have psychic disturbances passed on to them. This teaching really disturbed Ginger as she placed a lot of fear, blame, and unnecessary limitations on herself, writing, For a while, I tried to avoid places that even sold alcohol, including restaurants, grocery stores, and convenience stores. I thought this was the best way to avoid the abuse of alcohol, something I was sure would be inevitable if I let myself be exposed to it at all. I was trying to stay away from any possible association with disobedience. And so on every topic, I have had to come back and say, well, what does God's word actually say? And so the Bible is very clear about drinking. And it it, it simply says that alcohol is not a sin. Mm-hmm. And Jesus made wine at a wedding. 
Um, but also it does say that drunkenness is wrong and it's harmful to so many people. And so I, I see that balance. I personally don't drink, but I don't have a problem with other Christians. It's their liberty to drink if they so choose. Something else Ginger had to disentangle was Gothard's teachings on authority as it relates to courtship and marriage. Ginger writes, Gothard taught that when a couple gets married, there is a new structure of protection and authority, and the husband is the head of the house. But he also said that the young couple is under counsel of father and father-in-law, mother and mother-in-law. This idea is nowhere in God's word. Gothard invented a system whereby grown children still have to listen to their parents and obey their counsel. He maintained the authority of the parents even after the marriage vows. Another another layer of that was like, am I going to be under God's authority and protection? Um, or am I dishonoring God by, by doing that? Um, because adult kids, even women, can't ever have a job outside the home. You can't, um, like, well, you can't work outside the home, but you can't live outside of the home either. Until you're married. Until you're married, mm -hmm. then that transfers to your husband. Even if you're 40. No, even if you're 40, you you should remain at home. And mm -hmm. otherwise, it's this umbrella of authority that Bill Gothard taught mm -hmm. is that God is here, he's up here, and then your parents are here and you're below that umbrella. If you come out from under their authority by moving out of the home, by getting a job, then you're opening yourself up to Satan's attacks because you don't mm -hmm. have an umbrella to protect you. So that's what I believed wholeheartedly. In her book, Ginger would detail Gothard's unbiblical views on marriage writing, wives were pressured to smile and be upbeat at all times, no matter what they were feeling inside, and they were told to not have any expectations of their husbands. Here's one example of a time Gothard encouraged a wife to do just that. A woman that has dinner all ready for a husband, 6.30, but no husband. 7 o'clock, still no husband. 7.30, finally quarter of 8, the husband comes in. And by that time, She's hot and the food is cold. <laughs> and nothing tastes good that night because she said he should have called me ahead of time. He's going to be late. He knows he's supposed to call me. So nothing tastes good that night. So then let's say the next day that she follows this very important step. That evening, 6.30, no husband. 7, 7.30, still no husband. Finally, quarter of 8, the husband comes in. And when he comes in, she is thrilled to see him because she wasn't expecting him at all. Now, I guarantee that he's going to be aware of her new attitude. In fact, first he'll wonder what she wants, and then, then she'll wonder how long it's going to last. He'll wonder how long it's going to last. And when he sees that attitude lasting, then God begins to do a work in his life. Again, wives and anyone under authority, that matter of gratefulness is more powerful, more important than you realize. That's why Sarah, Sarah didn't trust Abraham. Maybe, maybe you didn't know that. Sarah never trusted Abraham. Some of you wives say, I can't trust my husband. Here's a, a daughter of Sarah. Sarah trusted God. Ginger would then work to disentangle his principle of suffering, writing, Gothard taught me that if I was suffering, there was a good chance it was because of some hidden secret sin in my life. He even said that most illnesses today are the result of bitterness or guilt or just lack of love. I quickly became terrified that if I didn't do everything I could to be agreeable, I'd face the consequences in the form of suffering. You know, we can't really even afford to be bitter. We can't afford to be bitter for several reasons. First of all, Doctors inform us that most illnesses today are the result of bitterness or guilt or just lack of love. And you say, wait a minute, what about just ordinary germs? Don't we uh, pick up just germs here and there? Don't they cause diseases and infections? And these doctors are very quick to come back and say, oh no, these germs won't affect you unless you're bitter. These germs won't affect you unless you're guilty. They're, they're called opportunistic agents. And these viruses, these bacteria, these funguses, 
and so on, they're in our body, but they don't hurt us as long as we're not guilty or bitter. But if we're guilty or bitter, it just simply means we lower our resistance and then these opportunistic agents swing into action and they bring about cancer. They bring about different diseases. In fact, we're told that most of us have um, different types of disease viruses in our body now. But as long as our resistance is high, don't affect us. Ginger writes that Gothard emphasized the need to obey authority so much that she began to think obey was the most important command in the Bible. Eventually, her relationship with God became a transaction. As Ginger continued to disentangle these teachings, she received the following revelation, quote, Gothard didn't teach me to be in awe of who God is and what he's done. Instead, he taught me to focus primarily on God's punishment. Gothard turned obedience into a matter of terror. If I misstepped in any way, I was removed from all protection and Satan would have full access. Upon meeting Ben and developing a relationship with Jeremy, Ginger was able to open her eyes and begin to see the dangers of what Gothard taught his followers. She writes, Bill Gothard would pick a subject and tell us what he thought the Bible said about that topic. He would begin a seminar on the problem in a verse or two. He'd spend the rest of the seminar, sometimes 60 to 80 minutes, giving his opinion on what that verse meant and how it applied to our lives. Of course, Gothard made it seem like his opinion was synonymous with the Bible's teaching. Once he convinced you of Scripture's command to obey him, he'd say you needed to take a vow to follow what he just said. As Ginger's awareness grew, she began to understand that Gothard's methods gave birth to superstitions rooted in control and manipulation. She writes, One of the first times Jeremy and I paused a Gothard lecture to discuss what we were hearing was after Gothard told a story about a woman who lived many years ago. Tragically, she became a widow and childless when her husband and three sons went off to sea and never returned. A pastor stopped to comfort her, but while he was there, he didn't provide comfort. Instead, he accused her of being the reason her family had died. He pointed to a painting hanging on her wall of a sailing boat and said, The problem is the picture over the mantle. If you didn't want your boys to go out to sea, you should have gotten rid of the picture for the sake of your children. Gothard used this story to argue that you have to be careful about everything, including the art you have in your home. During the days of the sailing ships, there was one mother who became a widow. Her husband was a sea captain, lost at sea. And she just pled with her sons, please don't go off to sea. And finally the first son went off to sea, and he went down with the ship. Next son went off to be a sailor, and he was killed at sea. And then when her youngest boy went off to be a sailor, she cried to the pastor. She said, Pastor, why have I lost my husband and three sons to the sea? And I've played with them not to go out. The pastor very wisely said to her, Your problem is the picture over the mantle. Picture of a beautiful sailing ship with the wind whipping the sails, the breeze, and all the adventure that that picture brings. He said, if you didn't want your boys to go out to sea, you should have gotten rid of that picture. Because your children, and I could give you other illustrations where the art in your home will have a far bigger effect upon your children than you realize. Ginger would also find his lectures on communion disturbing. During one of his seminars, he told his followers that if they had a secret sin that had yet to be expressed, it would bring physical destruction. Is there some secret sin that you've never confessed that'll bring more physical destruction than you can imagine? Is there some secret sin that's being continued? God says that if we don't thoroughly examine ourselves before communion on a regular basis, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many have died. Christian, former missionary doctor, who has uh, demonstrated clearly that if we would only consume, like the scripture talks about, 
greater amount of fiber and bread in our diet that we would not have colon cancer, we would not have appendicitis, we would not have... And, and he goes to a whole list of things. Would not have varicose veins, would not have kidney stones, would not have... I mean, a whole list of things in our life. And he demonstrates cultures around the world that have a high fiber diet. They don't have these things. But in our Western culture, where we don't have a high fiber diet, we have all kinds of cancers and um, illnesses and ailments, diseases, because we don't understand some of these things. So there are consequences there as well. Ginger ultimately came to the conclusion that Gothard was cultivating independence on himself through his teachings. She writes that he seemed to be manipulating his audience by saying that God's word wasn't clear and that he was the only one who had the keys to success in the Christian life, claiming that his principles would unlock the full potential of Christianity. In Ginger's eyes, Gothard's system was man-made and unbiblical. April of 2018 would be Ginger's last time attending an IBLP conference. From there, she would join her husband Jeremy at his church and continue to put distance between herself and what she described to be Bill Gothard's cult-like teachings. But after Ginger left the IBLP, adjusting and adapting to her new normal wouldn't be that easy as she struggled with social anxiety and critical thinking. Ginger writes, Why do pastors like Gothard have so many rules? Why do they teach that all Christians should dress the same, consume the same music and media, vote the same, and talk the same? Why did he even create rules about what food Christians are supposed to eat? I think he did that because uncertainty can be unsettling. Rules are easier than liberty. Gothard's rules gave me certainty, but they didn't teach me how to think. Such a difficult thing because you take these words and view them in a certain way because a teacher has told you that. And it's been a journey for me of disentangling, taking out the air. It's a slow process of examining everything. Do you feel everything. brainwashed? Is it like you are reprogramming? Yeah. Is that what I, I wasn't, is? yes. Because I, I think I wasn't really taught critical thinking and how to think yeah. for myself. I was taught like, this is the right answer. So I'd always be yeah. thinking, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? Instead of like viewing everything and thinking critically through it for myself, I just would give an answer from Bill Gothard's teaching or think that that was true. Ginger's deprogramming process would be a slow and painful one, but so was something else. She writes, a few years ago, it became abundantly clear to me that this man I had always looked up to as a model Christian was in fact no better than the false teachers Jesus and Paul described. Gothard was not only teaching his own principles instead of Christ, but reportedly harming those closest to him. For years, people in our circles talked about how Bill Gothard liked to surround himself with pretty girls. We all talked about how they were nicknamed Gothard's girls. They ranged from teenagers to women in their mid-30s. Most of them had long blonde hair, big smiles, and petite body types. Many came from single-parent homes, without a father or grandfather to guide and protect them. Those poor girls, they had no idea what they were getting into. Many of these girls would later testify that he would ask them to have private conversations with him. After a while, Gothard would rub the women's feet and hold their hands, both of which were strictly forbidden between a man and a woman who were not married. Several of his victims would say that he touched them inappropriately or engaged in explicit sexual activity. Ten of these ladies filed a lawsuit against Gothard in 2016. Allegations against him started to surface before 2012. In the subsequent years, more than 30 women would come forward. This 2016 lawsuit wasn't the first time Gothard was accused of wicked predatory behavior. In the late 70s, his brother Steve, who worked for the IBLP, was also accused of misconduct. It's so easy to like put all of your trust in a man like I kind of did for Bill Gothard. I, I would consider him like a grandfather to me. And whenever something like that shakes you, I remember when I got the call talking about him, I was like, man, like how did he fall? And then, and then I didn't believe it for many years that he actually did. And, and, and what, what happened there? 
he was accused by more than 30 women of um, misconduct um, with him. And he initially said, well, maybe I had handled some things wrong. Mm. So I was so shook by that because I was like, how can he be what I thought was more of a prophet from God? How can he say this and let us down? So those types of things would shake me. The accusations against Bill Gothard were shocking. But Ginger would find some similarities between him and her brother Josh, writing, One of the hardest realities in my life is that my brother Josh very publicly displayed some of the same hypocrisy as Gothard. He used his job and platform to promote the same ideas Gothard taught. But while he looked the part in so many ways, the true Josh appears to be much different. Do you see him as your brother? Ah, <sighs> that's... It's really tough. Um... I think that walking through such difficulties um, time and time again, I think for me, um, whenever I walked through that, it's something that I would look at and say, okay, my first off, my heart just breaks for the victims and their families. And that's who I pray for even first. And, um, and I just, my prayer for my brother would be, that he would have true transformation and change that can only happen from the inside out. And I think part of this story I'm telling is you can't put up all of these outward standards and rules and say that's going to do anything. It's not. Your your heart has to be changed from the inside out, and only Jesus can truly change that. And that's not something I saw in my brother. He's not truly changed. And so until God does that, it's only work God can do. You said you've not seen a true change in your brother. I would leave that, you know, up to whatever journey he's on right now. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him. In years, right? I haven't spoken to him in years. So I just would pray that he would be truly broken over what he's done. But I just pray for the victims and their families. And your parents at this point, I know it's also difficult to talk about them because they are your parents and you do love your parents. Um, How do you describe the relationship today, especially with the book coming out today? Yeah. I've sought to have conversations with my parents throughout the years of the differences I've gone through and the changes I've made. And I think that um, at the end of the day, I know they are still in those teachings and they still hold to Bill Gothard's teachings as important. And so I hope that with this book, it is my goal in writing it just to be able to tell my own story. And hopefully it will help anyone who is still in that system to see how damaging and how harmful it truly is. And I love my parents and I see how... What do you think they're thinking right now? You're on yeah. live TV. The book is out. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say what everyone's reactions are going to be to it. I just hope that they would see my genuine heart wanting to help people come out of this because I think until you're able to examine it according to the Bible and see, this is not Bible teaching. This guy claimed it was Bible teaching. It's not. It's harmful, damaging, fear-based manipulation and control. Ginger Duggar has come a long way from being the overly anxious, fearful girl she once was. Coming forward and exposing the harmful teachings that Gothard taught has been no easy journey, but for Ginger, it was worth it. On this journey, she has been able to bring light to Gothard's unbiblical legalistic approach, his manipulation, control, and abuse he exhibited on his followers. In closing out her book, she writes the following. When I look at the man-made rules I put so much hope in when I was young, I see only emptiness. More emptiness and hopelessness would have greeted me if I turned to the world, just as they've greeted so many who have gone down that path. There is only one place to turn for the kind of hope that never fails, Jesus Christ. Perhaps you are reading this book and you are not a Christian. Maybe you reject the strict conservative religious community that raised you and you picked up this book hoping I was going to tell you that I had turned my back on my faith. I can't leave Christianity because only there can I find Christ. He is worth it. Jesus is all that's left and all I will ever need. I can only live in the here and now and the future, like building my future for the life I want it to be. And 
that's the beauty of this journey for me has been realizing, yeah, I mean, I the teaching I grew up under was harmful. It was damaging and there are lasting effects. Mm-hmm. But I only want to now in this season to look at this and say, okay, I know other people who are struggling with this as well. People who are still stuck in this. I want to be um, vulnerable to share my story mm-hmm. and hopefully it will help just even one person to to be freed from this.